So, um, so uh, we're going to do this together, and uh, we're going to split the slides. So we'll probably we'll make some mistakes, but that should be fun. Um, so I'm Paul Fremantle. I'm the VP of Engineering here at WeaveWorks, and um, uh, previously uh, worked a lot in API management, uh, set up a company, and all sorts of stuff. And uh, I've been at WeaveWorks for about uh, nine months now, and I was really interested to get into this maturity model and look at how we see uh, various customer engagements and, and organizations we've worked with kind of move forward. And I think some of the talks we heard earlier today uh, from State Farm and from Deutsche Telekom really uh, fitted in well with what we're talking about today. So I think it'd be interesting. Tiffany. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Tiffany Waring, and I'm uh, be on the customer success team at WeaveWorks. And I work with um, customers who are at various points on their GitOps journeys. And yeah, really excited to discuss the GitOps maturity model with you all today. So, you know, what is a maturity model? I think probably the best definition comes from Martin Fowler's uh, blog. And uh, he talks about, you know, figuring out what capabilities you need to acquire in order to move to the next level of performance. And uh, rightly, he points out that there are good and bad things about maturity models. You know, we've seen a lot of them. They aren't always, they aren't always great. But, you know, what we really saw was multiple different journeys that organizations have taken in the few years since GitOps started. And... You know, this is really why Tiffany and, and other people in the customer success team here who, who spend a lot of time working with customers have got a lot of experiences. And that's really where this has come from. But of course, our experiences may be different from yours. And so if you're listening to this and you have input, we'd love to hear it. And one of the things that we want to kind of cover is like the benefits and trade-offs of, of different ways of using GitOps as you go up this maturity model. So it's a very simple maturity model. It just has four steps. And, and actually, the first step is not quite doing GitOps. So we see a lot of people out there who uh, start uh, doing uh, using Git to manage workloads, infrastructure, configurations, everything, a lot of declarative state, but not fully doing reconciliation maybe not fully declarative. Uh, and so they're kind of at the prerequisite stage, but they're not actually fully into GitOps. And then, and then of course, you know, we see people start to really use GitOps. And the starting point is often a workload, reconciling your application workload. Uh, and that's a core step and, and brings a huge amount of value. And then, and then we see uh, enterprises, and I think State Farm was a, a great example, uh, who are GitOpsing everything. Uh, the infrastructure, the cluster management, configs, and workloads, and, and figuring out how to do that. And finally, we have some examples where we see organizations that are managing whole fleets and doing advanced policy enforcement. And I think the talk from Deutsche Telekom was an, a perfect example of that. So let's, we're going to go through each of these levels. Uh, and what's level zero? Well, of course, you know, it is possible to do GitOps with things that aren't Kubernetes, but fundamentally you need things to be declarative, and Kubernetes is the, is the, is the leading example of that. So you know, using Kubernetes and doing cloud native and using Git to version control infrastructure and deployment is, is level zero. But why is that not level one? Why is that not GitOps? You know, uh, we have lots of examples where not everything is declarative. Some aspects are imperative or even manual. Uh, most common at this level is no automatic deployment and reconciliation. So there's a one-time push. It solves day zero, but it doesn't solve day n. And more importantly, the systems can diverge from the source of truth, uh, and so visibility and audit are affected. And a really good way of looking at this is to go read the GitOps principles from the GitOps working group, uh, which I'm sure has been mentioned, uh, which really talk about what, what the differences are. And, and, and what we're seeing here really is people who are not applying all of those. So I'm going to hand over to um, 
Tiffany now, who's going to tell us about level one. Thanks, Paul. So GitOps workflows at the application layer have a great impact on developer velocity and Dora metrics. With core GitOps, the most important consideration is adherence to the GitOps principles that Paul just mentioned. These include declarative definition of desired state in this level for applications, which are stored in and versioned with Git. All intended changes to the environments are made via pull request and can be automatically applied to the system. And software agents detect, drift, and reconcile running state to desired state as you've defined in Git. At this level of the GitOps maturity model, cluster and infrastructure provisioning definitions are declarative infrastructure as code, but don't include ongoing reconciliation and drift detection. We thought we'd highlight some of the successes that WeWorks customers and users of Flux have won in the real world with core GitOps. Um, so with Global Freight Solutions, they were able to increase deployment speed and frequency by 75%. They found that their developers spent 75% more time coding and their release cadence moved from weekly to multiple times a day. With Cordoba, they increased their deployments by almost 60% and reduced mean time to recovery from hours to minutes and thus improved their customer response time by 43%. And they were able to meet SOC 2 compliance with full audit trails and increase time efficiency and reliability for redeployments. Now go to, yep, thanks. Um, with enterprise GitOps, the entire environment from cluster and infrastructure provisioning, configuration and application workloads all adhere to GitOps workflows. Cluster considerations are typically managed separately from application workloads and management of security, role-based access control, governance, and policy are all part of a Git workflow. Since all aspects of the systems are GitOps compliant, then this means that everything you have is stored as code in Git, including policy. Improvements at this level can be made um, with package and template customization and management for use across the entire company, um, effectively making Kubernetes accessible to those who might not have had previous experience. And once the entire system is GitOps, there are also additional opportunities to further improve the deployment model with progressive delivery, for instance, which reduces the amount of time it takes for a change to be promoted safely to production. Some examples of companies running enterprise GitOps include uh, the National Australia Bank, whose single Kubernetes platform uh, pattern delivers for their entire organization. And with GitOps, they were able to automate things like their node updates, um, as well as increase reliability and gain time savings with automated cluster provisioning and management. For Fidelity in Investments, they were able to achieve reliable cluster lifecycle management, all conducted through pull requests, they also created a self-service Kubernetes platform management system for their application engineers. Enterprise GitOps also streamlined Fidelity's efforts to create reproducible clusters across environments and multiple public clouds while meeting governance and compliance regulations. And Paul, back to you for scaled GitOps. Thank you, Tiffany. And you know, one of the things that you're really hearing again as we go in this is that as people move up these levels they get more compliance more governance but also improve those dora velocity metrics which are really important and one of the things that that we see some of our kind of more advanced customers doing is when they start to manage multiple clusters they want to treat those clusters like as fleets so rolling out updates across the whole fleet and, and really kind of, you know, Kubernetes gave us this ability to, to treat workloads in a, in a kind of completely declarative autonomous way with pods and, and nodes. And now this is really treating clusters like pods or nodes and saying, hey, we can just manage whole thousands of clusters uh, without needing thousands of SREs fundamentally and 
we heard Deutsche Telekom talking about advanced policy enforcement they were using Kiverno and, and Kubediff and various systems. And what we see at this level is really trying to get those security and best practices into the GitOps automation and runtime. And you know, some of those examples we saw at level two are also doing some multi-cloud, but the ability to really do complex multi-cloud, hybrid, and bare metal scenarios uh, it really comes into its own when you get these kind of fleet management models, because as people scale things to the edge, naturally that's where you get thousands of Kubernetes clusters. And that's exactly what we heard from Deutsche Telekom with their dust shift story and, and I have the same link that, that uh, we saw earlier and they're fundamentally scaling out to uh, thousands of, of clusters managing 5G rollout and actually they're going to build on those bare metal clusters they're going to build multiple virtual clusters in a model that the uh, book calls liquid metal uh, and is also part of this. So this is this is kind of really interesting and one of the things that we've noticed as people build out this story, we see a kind of a shift. And, and I think the early, visit, the early usage of, of GitOps and the, and the early maturity is often driven by development and DevOps teams. So they, they get those uh, improved velocity, better provisioning, uh, reduced mean time to recovery, they start to really improve their development cycles as they get into level one. They get better integration with their existing processes and development processes. So this really works well at, at level one and two for development and DevOps teams. And then what we see is as the system scales out to platform and security teams and, and you get platform operators, then levels two and three really start to bring in significant benefits for them. And I, th I think you heard that from what Tiffany uh, was describing in level one and two, which is that uh, at level one, there's these huge improvements in velocity and Dora metrics. And at level two, we start to get more focus on things like SOC compliance, on uh, governance, on, on knowing that the clusters are secure and managed. And so that ability to really manage thousands of clusters consistency with policy controls and governance is, is kind of a, a, a key factor in, in using GitOps to level three. There is one point I'd really like to make it though, which is that this is not you know, a race to the top. Not everybody is gonna want to do all of this. Not everybody has a fleet that they need to manage. Uh, they don't, not everyone has thousands of clusters. So part of, the, I think, the benefit of any maturity model, and, and particularly this maturity model, is that this is, this is not one size fits all. This is about looking at how you can choose the benefits you need and figure out, well, would it help me to manage my cluster workloads? Would it help me to manage multiple clusters as fleets? Uh, would it help me to add in policy uh, checks and so forth. And so that's really what we've done with this slide is to try and capture the benefits. So I'm going to hand back to Tiffany. Thanks, Paul. Um, so at this point, we've spent some time discussing these various levels of the GitOps maturity model, including some of the characteristics and benefits, as well as some real world examples. Um, and not only does GitOps and the different levels of maturity model uh, provide benefits for engineering teams, as Paul demonstrated on the previous slide, but those absolutely translate to business benefits as well. Um, and they're summarized on this slide, so we won't spend too much time uh, reiterating. But Paul mentioned at the top of this talk that the maturity model is a great way of scoping out incremental steps, um, especially if you are new to GitOps. Um, and while it is certainly possible to adopt GitOps across all your teams in one go, uh, this maturity model demonstrates a way to evaluate an iterative approach to GitOps adoption and maturation. Thanks, Tiffany. So uh, this talk is obviously just a, a little summary. Uh, we actually are just today publishing a little white paper on this. Um, there will be more, you know, this is the, the start of it. 
And as I said at the beginning, you know, this is evolving and we would love your feedback. Uh, there's the Slack channel. Uh, you can email me. Uh, you can contact uh, me and Tiffany on the on the uh, on various methods, LinkedIn, all sorts. But you know, we would love your feedback, and uh, please please take a look at this paper and, and give us your feedback. I think that'd be really useful. So, as ever, questions in the Slack channel, and we are going to publish these slides. And there's a few links. And I should also just say that this is not just me and Tiffany, but Richard Case, Charles Sibold, Anita, and, and plenty of others in the customer success team have contributed. So thank a big shout out to all those who've really helped us build this. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I know we have a little, like a minute left early. So uh, what I was reflecting on, we were kind of typing notes in the background is uh, uh, reflecting on last year and. Cornelia sort of talking about the, you know, the beginnings of the concept of the principles of GitOps and, and how she based those on, you know, past discussions about DevOps and how these concrete um, benefits are attributed to some of the most successful and successfully growing companies. So it was so exciting to see real company names here listed and, and hearing their, their real benefits. So I think that that was uh, very helpful to hear. So. Um, thanks for putting in all the work. So is this a continuing, you're saying this kind of continuingly working project, you, you're publishing something now, but is this something that you're looking to see that would evolve over the years? Uh, absolutely. So we are, um, so the, the white paper, actually the, the, one of those slides is not in the white paper. It's some work we've done since we put the white paper together. And um, so I think we'll kind of either expand the white paper or, or publish a second one. And, and certainly, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm really interested to hear what, what other people have to say, what other experiences there are. Uh, this is not just about Flux and, and WeaveWorks. This is, a, this is kind of general experiences that we've seen across the industry, and, and so we want that wider feedback as well. Excellent. <clears throat> well, thank you to both for speaking, like I said, very late <laughs> in your hour and, and presenting this. This is very, very helpful. 